costume in the 1600s played such a huge part in politics and what would happen and it played its part in the fate of individuals and so let's take a look at costume of the early baroque era listen you can say baroque or you can say baroque i go between the two costume of the early baroque era but don't worry baroque will be explored and explained in depth when we get to versailles just so you know what we mean by the word baroque okay let's start off with men and here we have another beautiful uh, picture by van dyke okay these are english men but this was the look across the courts and nobility of europe and a less fancy style applied to uh, less grandiose people let's break it down you'll see that the elizabethan ruff has gone instead we have something called a falling band this was a wide flat collar worn by both men and women it could be simple linen it could be trimmed with lace or it could be entirely made of lace and it is called a falling band we're sticking with the doublet for the time being, but it's really changed, hasn't it? Doublets now have a very high waistla waistline and a loose and flared fit, kind of flares out at the bottom. And buttons or hooks and eyes replace laces. Sleeves are billowing, so it's a much looser kind of silhouette. Capes. Capes often matching both doublet and breeches. And here are the breeches. The hose has gone, although men still wore under hose. And these breeches were secured to the doublet with hooks. Boots. Look at those boots, aren't they gorgeous? Boots had heels, they were kind of loose and they had a funnel shaped opening at the top and latchets, which are decorative leather straps over the instep. We still call them latchets. Hair was shoulder length flowing and real. No wigs yet, none of those periwigs that we'll see in a bit. This was real hair and real hair, long flowing real hair would play a huge political role very soon oh my goodness fashion is such a response it is not an island and fashion would get so many people into trouble in the 1600s here is a surviving uh, outfit from the 1630s and take a look it's really quite fancy isn't it and yet it's a much more masculine look. I know there's a ton of lace there and he's got long flowing hair, but it's much more masculine, isn't it, than the tight little doublets and uh, upper hose that we saw in the Elizabethan era. Well, why? Fashion is not an island. It's a response. Elizabeth was dead. Now the world was run by men again. Hats were wide brimmed and usually adorned with buckles and feathers. And then around his waist, there's a baldric. Now, a baldric was a thick leather belt, although you could have a tapestry baldric. And later on in the 1600s, baldrics would be made of uh, silk or satin, more like a sash. But it was worn around the body, across the body, and a sword uh, uh, was attached to it. Cannons. These were lace or ruffs attached to the top of the hose or the bottom of the breeches. But one of the most popular garments, it was worn by the military, it was worn by uh, people who lived in the country, it was worn when men went riding. It was like an everyday kind of garment, sort of like a denim jacket today, was this. It was called a buff coat. It was extremely popular. It had either long or short sleeves, and it was made out of buckskin, you know, the, the skin of deers. And there is a portrait of somebody with all of these elements, including a buff coat. His is short sleeves, but you can see everything going on here. He has those boots with the funneled top and latchets and the lace cuffs 
and the falling band and the flowing hair and the baldric, it's all going on there. Do you like it? I really like it. But I want you to, to uh, notice that although, yes, it's a much more masculine silhouette than we saw in the Elizabethan era, the detailing that went into this stuff for the uh, aristocracy was really incredible. Take a look at the embroidery on these breeches and this doublet. And look at the button detail here and that embroidery with all of those tiny, 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 minuscule little beads. Male attire was more adorned than female attire in the 1600s. And quite honestly, I think that female attire was all the more elegant as a consequence. Hats during this era were wide brimmed as I mentioned before and here is a reconstruction. You'll see that uh, the, the crown of the hat is actually quite flat but it usually had some kind of jewel on it or buckle and would be turned up at the side. Very suave. So let's take a look at female attire in the first half of the 17th century. You're going to see a far softer silhouette. I'm sure you've noticed this already than we have seen in the Elizabethan or the Tudor era. Soft and billowing. I love it. I think this is such a pretty and feminine and soft silhouette. But let's break it down. Let's start with a lady. Now, I've chosen quite a full-figured lady here to act as our model because she really had the ideal body of this era. In fact, there is a name for this type of gorgeous, voluptuous, little bit chubby body. And it comes from the painter Rubens, who always painted these lovely, voluptuous ladies. The word is Rubenesque. It's sort of a, a nice way of saying a little bit chubby or pleasantly rounded, Rubenesque. So we're going to use the ideal body type so you can better understand why fashion responded. All right, it would start off with a shift. You know, in some eras it's called a chemise, in other eras it's called a uh, smock. In this era, it is called a shift. Basically, this is your simple linen underdress, your underwear really. Over it went a bodice, then a separate underskirt, over which went something called an overskirt, but you see it goes all the way up to the top and incorporates both the top part of the body and the bottom, it's still called an underskirt. A stomacher, we've met the stomacher before, lace sleeves and you will see and I'm sure you've noticed already that taffeta and lace replace the brocades and velvets of the earlier century for wealthy and fashionable women. Remember when we looked at Elizabethan and Tudor attire and uh, uh, a lot of the quattrocento the, the, Cinquecento as well, we saw a lot of quite heavy fabrics, we saw a lot of brocade and velvet and this kind of thing. In this era, taffeta was the textile of choice and a lot of lace and satin too sometimes. All right, a lace standing collar, but way at the back, which would soon be replaced by a falling, one of those falling band collars. Pearls, a string of pearls quite high on the neck and pearl earrings, that was the, the accessory, the jewellery. In nearly every Van Dyke portrait you look at, you'll see women with a string of pearls and pearl earrings. Hair was centre parted, quite full at the sides with ringlets. And hats, sort of it just imitated men's hats. And there we have it. And you'll notice the silhouette. 
sloping rounded shoulders and a high waistline. Like this. This is what it looked like when it all came together. This is Henrietta Maria again, fashion icon, and she has a, a falling band collar. But then uh, the stomacher started to be incorporated into the dress thanks to new technologies in hooks and eyes. It meant that hooks, you could get the top part of your bodice tight enough without having to lace a stomacher in, although you still could. It came in and out as the century progressed. But here you can see everything is incorporated and this is actually a very fancy look for women. And I'd like you to note this. This was a very popular trim throughout the 1600s. It's called a rosette. It's uh, a ribbon kind of formed and looped to look like a little rose or a little flower, a rosette. So let's take a look at Puritan attire. Don't get too excited. Yeah. Yeah. Structurally, it's absolutely the same as what we saw in a non-Puritan attire. And don't get me wrong, not everyone who was in the nobility or uh, enjoyed fashion was a Catholic. Far from it. You could be a Protestant without being a Puritan, and this is important. But take a look at these uh, outfits. It's a myth that Puritans wore black all the time. You no, know, they wore black on Sundays only. And this really explains it all. Do you know why they didn't wear black all the time? Because they thought black was too fancy. It was too fancy. That should only be saved for Sundays, the hardcore worship day. They usually wore brown or gray. No colors, no lovely bright colors. No, black was too fancy. And here is a reconstruction of a typical Puritan dress. On their heads, they wore steeple-crowned hats. Women wore coifs on their heads, but also steeple-crowned hats, which they would wear over their coifs. Now, I should explain something to you. There were levels of Puritanism. Obviously, the separatists, as they, they were uh, kind of known, who came on the Mayflower, they were your hardcore Puritans. But there were different levels. There were people who, you know, enjoyed the Puritan idea but allowed themselves a little lace, for example. There were levels of it. Like this lady here, I think she looks quite elegant. She is a Puritan, but look, she has um, a taffeta bow. Uh, she has a bracelet on. So there were levels. All right. But hardcore Puritans did not like fashion. They did not approve of it. So I'm sure they wouldn't be so th too thrilled to learn that the Puritan look is on the high fashion runways today. Here are some looks that obviously draw huge inspiration from the Puritan fashion aesthetic. So let's look at fashion of the high Baroque era. And you will discover that it's Louis, not Lagerfeld, who's the real king of fashion. And as a consequence, female attire in the 17th century is far less elaborate and far less decorative than male attire. Louis XIV set strict rules for court dress. Although nobody was allowed to dress more extravagantly than he was, his rules were almost the opposite to the sumptuary laws of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance that we've already looked at. Louis's rules were that every nobleman must wear a certain and specific set of very expensive clothes for every individual occasion, and this included their wives, of course. If nobles weren't wearing the right set of clothes, they weren't allowed to court and to go to court, and they had to be at court. They had to be close to Louis, fannying around, kissing his ass, because because if they weren't there, they would lose power. They would lose prestige. Some of the French nobility actually went bankrupt trying to keep up with the king's fashion rules. 
But this is where he was so clever. He'd lend you money for your clothes, for your wardrobe. This would put you forever in his debt, meaning that he had robbed you of your power but could rely upon your support. See, didn't I tell you that clothing and fashion was used to political extent in the 1600s like never before or ever since. Further to this, um, well, that's just me making the point again, further to this, Louis also made it illegal for nearly everything that makes up clothing to be imported. Uh, imported. As a consequence, France became the world's largest and best producers of lace. The, sh the town of Chantilly is particularly good at it. You know you've heard of Chantilly lace, obviously. This employed thousands of people and it boosted France's economy, particularly its exports. He also mandated that the streets of Paris be lit up at night to promote late night shopping. It was Louis who um, kind of invented shopping as a leisure activity. In short, he invented the fashion industry as we know it and forever secured Paris as the international capital of fashion. There is a wonderful book about it all called The Essence of Style by Joan Dijon. How the French invented high fashion, fine food, chic cafe, style, sophistication, and glamour. It is a fascinating book, and there you have Louis on the cover. I read this book, and this is how I discovered all this cool stuff. And this is just part of it. It has so many good stories. As I just mentioned, women were less decorative. But the silhouette did change a little from the earlier part of the 1600s because of this. This is called a basque. This is the back of it. Okay, it laced at the back and it had a very long point at the front. So it was kind of like a corset. And here you see it again, except that it was visible. So this is the back that you're seeing on the left and this is how it functioned. So it gave women a higher waist and this pointed um, uh, front here, still with the scooped neck and the slopey shoulders, though, and the billowing sleeves. And this is a very accurate uh, reconstruction of what a robe, a dress, you know that, that a robe is the French for dress, right? La robe is the dress. With a shift underneath and then this basque dress underneath, again in taffeta, sometimes in satin. And really, it wasn't adorned all that much. There was a trend to wear a string of pearls diagonally over your body, kind of like a, a baldric on a man, and a brooch at the front. Hats imitated male hats. Male hats at this point became extremely large, extremely decorative, with a lot of ostrich feathers. And this, I think, is a really beautiful silhouette. I love it. I love the softness. I love the balance of it. Now, sometimes, occasionally, because of Louis's laws about fashion, remember, he was using fashion to control his nobility, the dresses would have to be fancier, else you weren't allowed in court. But I personally prefer the simpler look. And look, she's carrying her shoes. Mules were the preferred shoes of the nobility during the High Baroque. Basically, they're mules, they're backless high-heeled shoes, same as we have today. It was really men who strutted their stuff as the peacocks of the High Baroque. Whoa, take a look at that. Let's break it down. A heavily trimmed hat. A periwig. Well, look at the periwig in a second. A cravat or jabot. You can say jabot if you like. Cravat or jabot, which was a, a scarf or this uh, thing called a jabot, which is a lacy kind of flap at the front of your collar. Like that. Here's Louis wearing one. Brocade vests replace doublets. You have a 
billowing shirt with lace sleeves, lace cuffs, ribbon loop trim. Ribbon loop was the trim of choice in the 1600s. And here is a close-up of some real ribbon loop. You can see what it is. It's, you know, velvety ribbons. You can, these ones are velvety. They can be any kind of ribbon. that are looped and then sewn together like this. Petticoat breeches. I know it looks like he's wearing a skirt. He's not. These are very full petticoat breeches. Lace cannons and high-heeled shoes. Wow. This is really decorative, isn't it? And take a look at these shoes that exist. Look at the one on the right. It's sort of like Missoni, isn't it? These are men's shoes. My goodness. And capes covers it all. And here is a surviving outfit, very similar to the one in the sketch. Take a look at the ribbon loop trim everywhere. Take a look at the embroidery. Just take a look at it all. And if we put a hat and a wig on top, oh my goodness, we're really seeing that this is the height of fashion. And I'd like you to note that moustaches were rather popular during this era, too. Another item I'd just like you to be aware of is this one. Again, look at the trim. Look at all of that gold embroidery. This is called a juste cour, and it was a coat that was used for riding primarily, a flared fitted jacket with slits at the front side and back for horse riding, but a very flared out bottom. All right, periwigs. Periwigs, the word periwig, comes from the French perruque. Perruque means wig. In French, it still does. The anglicized version is periwig, and we eventually just uh, dropped the peri and used the wig. And it was Louis who started it, because Louis started to go bald. You can tell in this painting that he's already thinning a bit on top. Now that you've got a sense of Louis, you can imagine how much he hated this. So, he started wearing these long, gorgeous, voluminous, curly wigs. And of course, because Louis wore them, everybody had to wear them. And everybody did. Here are some images of these full-bottomed periwigs. It was practical, okay? It was practical as well. There was an awful lot of lice around in the 1600s, so guys would cut their hair short or shave their heads completely and wear a wig. Wigs would stay in fashion for the next uh, 100, 150 years. All through the remainder of the 1600s and all of the 1700s, although in a different uh, style, wigs would be worn by men. And we get a lot of expressions from the era of the periwig. Expressions like, keep your hair on. Have you heard that one? If someone's losing their temper, we say, oh, keep your hair on. This comes from uh, men in Parliament uh, during the 1600s or 1700s, losing their temper and taking their wigs off and throwing them across the room. Keep your hair on. Uh, Wigging out, all of these uh, ideas really come from the periwig. It was practical. The wigs, well, it, just like uh, uh, wigs today or extensions, the quality of the wig depended on what you could afford. The best wigs were made out of human hair, obviously. But then if you couldn't afford human hair, you could use horse hair. There was no synthetic hair at that time, but you would use horse hair, maybe uh, goat hair. But really, I think the people we're looking at today, the aristocracy, all had human hair and people would sell their hair. By the end of the 1600s, wigs were powdered. They became powdered. During the mid 1600s, they were dark because Louis was dark and so was uh, Prince Charles. We'll see what happens to him. But then as we get into the later 1600s and then throughout the 1700s, wigs were powdered white or a grayish white. 
Children, just take a look at these images. They're so adorable. I think I might like Baroque children even more than Elizabethan children. They dress like their parents. I like the first little guy over there on the right. He's adorable. And then look next to him, a little tiny cavalier. But please note on his shoulder the ribbon loop trim. And they have ribbon loop trim as well on the far uh, right. Two little boys there. Remember what I said about boys wearing skirts? But the third girl along in the pink dress, that is a little girl. So basically children are dressed like their parents. We saw that in the Elizabethan era and we'll see it throughout the 1700s. And uh, most of the 1800s, really only when we get into the Victorian era, that there is a notion of children's wear. But I think these guys and girls are adorable. I want to take just a second to tell you what was happening in the court of Spain. Something really strange was happening with fashion. This was happening. And this. And this. This is weird. These paintings are by Velázquez. Remember I said we'd look at him in terms of fashion. And these incredibly wide skirts were constructed with something called a pannier, a pannier. But we will look at the pannier next week when we do Rococo fashion, when the pannier made a big comeback. At this point, it was really only the Spanish court that used them. Also, I would like you to look at the hair styles. All of, all three of these images have hair that is this weird shape but this picture this is queen anna maria of spain philip ii's wife with the most extraordinary haircut or hairdo i have ever seen made with wigs hair pieces obviously why why you know that fashion is never an island it is a response what the hell was all of this responding to. Well, it didn't take much research to figure it out. Look at the shape of her hair. And then look at this. This is an Aztec crown. Take a look at this. It's the same shape. This is an Incan artifact showing an Incan king or god. What was happening in Spain in the 1600s? This was all about their conquest of the Americas. They had destroyed the Aztec civilization. They had destroyed the Incas in Peru. Spain ruled that part of the world. They ruled the new continent. And their whole court fashion was an expression of this. The expanse of their skirts symbolized the expanse of the Spanish Empire. And you know what? Their hair styles did too. 17th century Spanish court fashion was a reflection of its conquest of Central and South America. And these hairdos were a pretty literal demonstration that the Spanish had stolen the crown from the Aztecs and the Incans. Because fashion is always a response. And didn't I tell you at the beginning that every single thing that we are, we are looking at today is a response to something else. And these hairdos from the Spanish court are the most perfect example of fashion responding. The restoration Okay, we've been looking at what's been happening in France. We've been looking at what's been happening in Spain. They were the superpowers. What was happening in England? Well, 11 years, almost 11 years of the Commonwealth. 11 years of Cromwell. No music, no parties, no fashion, no Christmas. Cromwell died. And guess what his supporters wanted? They wanted his son to take over as leader of the country. Hello, isn't this what Cromwell was totally against? Wasn't this the whole idea to not have these kind of ruling families where 
power just succeeds to the next in line. Fortunately, his son was sensible and said, uh uh, no thanks, not interested. But after almost 11 years of Cromwell, here's the irony the English wanted a king again. So, Charles, Prince Charles, came out of exile where he'd been living with his cousin at Versailles and in 1660 he was crowned King Charles II and this period until his death in 1685 is known as the Restoration the Restoration King Charles was known as the Merry Monarch he was very smart he came back to a country that had been so fed up with no fun that he put fun right back on the agenda. Dancing and music and celebrations were allowed again. He reopened the theatres. In fact, there is a whole genre of uh, theatre, of plays, that became extremely popular during this era. Plays that were funny, that were very sexy and rompy. And they are known as restoration comedies. This is his mistress. He had lots of mistresses. He liked the ladies. She was an actress called Nell Gwynn. But look at this portrait of her. It's a nude. I think you're getting the idea this was a pretty sexy time. After such an uptight Puritan decade, you can imagine people were desperate for fun, music, flirtation and fashion. And fashion responded. I'm going to show you a series of images, all from a famous uh, painter of the Restoration, Peter Lely. But take a look at all of these images. Okay, the one on the left, the far left, her boob is showing. Now, this was just for dramatic effect. She didn't go around with her boob showing. But look at all of them. They all look a little bit disheveled. Um, these beautiful, loose, fitting, taffeta dresses kind of falling off the shoulders. Their hair a little bit uh, askew. The whole idea was to look disheveled, a little bit intentionally disheveled. And I explain it here. Women's clothing at the start of the Restoration was loose, billowy, voluptuous, and intentionally a little disheveled for that just-been-romping look. And hair was wide at the sides and again with these disheveled ringlets. The whole idea was to look relaxed and as if you had just been tumbling out of tumbling around in a bed with someone. And take another look at all of those beautiful, voluptuous images. And think about palette. And then ask yourself what two colours did Cromwell dislike the most? Gold and blue, which is why during the Restoration, all you see is gold and blue. Gold and blue. Everybody wearing gold and blue. But I love fashion of the Restoration. I love this casual, billowing look. I love how simple clothing was. Back to fashion. Here's something fascinating. Political caution leads to a menswear staple. All right, Charles, he was beloved, but um, he was smart. He was mindful of the role that an excessive interest in fashion had played in his dad's demise. Remember, there were many people in the country still who didn't want a king. There were many parliamentarians who did not believe that he should be there at all. So he prudently issued a, de a decree to all the gentlemen of the court, laying down very strict rules about dress. He didn't want to get into the same trouble that his dad had gotten into. Remember how the monarchy were completely criticized for their excessive interest in fashion and the spending on clothing. His rules were that the nobility, the male nobility, were commanded to wear a jacket, breeches, a shirt and a cravat or a jabot. Only those four items, plus their hat and shoes, etc. So, they looked like this. 
a jacket, breeches, a shirt, and a cravat. This was to give the uh, illusion that everybody was being sensible, they were being thrifty, they were not uh, buying into any crazy new fashion fads from Europe. It was the rule, and everybody had to follow it. Jacket, pants, suit, and tie. Well, that idea wouldn't last long, would it? <laughs> Shirt, suit, and tie. It became an absolute staple, and it started in the Restoration. It started with Charles II. See, fashion is never an island. It's always a response. And so because of this new silhouette for men, throughout Europe, female attire began to echo this new very vertical male silhouette. You saw in Restoration female costume, it was very wide and billowy. This changed. Suddenly the silhouette became vertical, like this. And this type of dress is called a mantua, a mantua. And this hairdo with this wired uh, fabric headdress is called a fontange. And this is what it looks like. It's very elegant and it just adds to the vertical silhouette. It was about being very stretched out and tall and vertical. Completely different. Remember, throughout the 1700s, 1600s up to this point, hair had been very full at the sides, hadn't it? Suddenly, no. In the late 1600s, the silhouette changed. Remember, fashion changes when the silhouette changes. And it becomes very tall, very high. Another item of clothing in this new silhouette that I want to discuss with you is this. This is a hunting dress and jacket. It's a skirt and jacket and a shirt. And look at the guy on the, the left and then look at her. This outfit imitated male attire. And this is really the first time we're seeing this. <laughs> 